churches and pastors, I think, kind of share, uh, they share a couple of things. Um, there are certain things, I think, that pastors just hate to preach about. And the congregation, I think, hates to hear. And, and so it's kind of like one of those things where you as a pastor um, have to be bold enough, and you as a pastor and leader have to be uh, strong enough for both of you. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about this morning came uh, as a last minute, like, I don't mean last minute, like, at 8 o'clock this morning, uh, I woke up and said, I'm going to be preaching this. Now, it probably started Thursday morning with me. Um, God lay sharing it on my heart, um, the condition of our church. Uh, I've been planning for months to, to begin the launch of 40 Days in the Word. And so what God's called me to do is I'm going to put that off um, three weeks, this week, next week, and another week. And I want to talk to you guys about margin. Um, when I hand you a piece of paper like like uh, like this, most of you guys, well, most of you will read it if it looks like this, but most of you will read it if it looks like this. You know why? There's a lot of margin. There's tons of more. Um, my mother-in-law is a sweet woman, and I love seeing her posts on Facebook, and, and I love hearing about them, and I love reading her emails, but I, I am listening to her emails, because I won't read them, because she doesn't, when she writes, she is a writer, and I mean a, a full-fledged writer, and when she writes, she leaves a small amount of Margin. I'm a bullet guy. You know what bullets are? Point. Right. Point. Right. Point. And then that's it. I'm there. And then, but I mean, having said this, I have to admit, with my mother-in-law in the right in the area of writing, when you walk away from her email, you are fully informed. <laughs> when you walk away from my email, you're lacking a little bit of information. Sometimes I have to contact me and we'll talk on the phone and, and we'll get it all worked out. <laughs> but I think there are areas in life where like writing or something like that where margin is probably a big deal but not that much of a big deal. I know in the area of advertising you want to see a lot of margin but when it comes to when it comes to living your life I believe you've got to have margin. I believe with everything in your life, you have to have margin. And the three areas that I'm going to, that Randy and I, Randy is going to share one of the messages, the, the three areas of life I believe that you've got to have margin is financial, and I believe you've got to have margin schedule, in your schedule, and I believe you've got to have margin in your morals. Um, You've got to, if you're going to live a moral life, you've got to create some form of more margin between yourself and immorality. If you're going to live a stress-free life as your schedule is concerned, you can't be double, triple, and quadruple booking yourself. You can't be leaving um, um, one birthday party to get to another birthday party to get to another birthday party to get to another birthday party and then expect to have the afternoon to do stuff at home. You might as well hang it up. You got to somehow or another start creating some margin in your life. Um, the electricity in this church was cut off Wednesday lack to lack of non-payment. Because our church has been operating on no margin. Zero. And, you know, as I began to pray through this, and I began to struggle, you know, it's not like our church is spending gazillions of dollars on, on mortgage, because we have none. We don't, we don't go into debt. It's not because our church has been buying outlandish uh, projects. It's not because we pay 
the staff an enormous amount of salary. Matter of fact, this church pays full part time for a full time staff. Just because I have I have been able to secure for my family outside resources to sponsor us, other people who believe in this ministry that don't go to this church. I believe that the issue is not that this church is selfish. Because I know this church, I know most every one of you intimately. And I know that you guys are not selfish. You're, 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 you're a loving people, you're a giving people. What I really believe the root problem with our church in the area of giving, which, which comes out to about, if you, do, if you were to analyze it and look at it, it's probably the norm American giving in a church, and that's less than around 2%. And the biblical standard, and I'm not going to back away from this, and I may get eight emails until the sun comes home. I know what to do with those. It's a little trash can. Delete. And I may get people that say, oh, I'm not going back to that church because they talk about money. So if you've been here for 12 months, you know the man has not talked about money not one Sunday in the last 12 months. So you can't get me on that one. And I'm not one of these health and wealth guys that says if you need it and claim it, it's going to happen because that just may not be the will of God. That's not what the Bible teaches. But I am a biblical stewardship giving person. I give 10% of my income every Sunday to this church. 10%. Well, matter of fact, a little over 10%. And I'm wanting to take it higher because I want to see God use this church to another level. And plus, I want to see God do something in my life that I, that can't, I can't explain. Have somebody give, every time I have somebody who gives to something, they'll always inevitably come back to me and say, You know what? God has blessed me since I became a giver. It happens every single time. What I believe is the problem with this church is not that we're not generous and not that we don't care and not that we don't have a passion. Because I'm going to tell you something. The reason I'm standing up with you guys today is I believe with everything in my heart that this place is worth it. Now, if you had talked to me, amen. Catastrophe. 
If you were have to have a financial situation that would come into your life, would you be able to weather that storm? Would you be able to, to plow through? Would you be able to just to just to, to, to stay on your ground if a financial storm happened? Well, last week was kind of the church's opportunity to make my paycheck. I didn't get paid last Sunday. I don't know if I'm getting paid today after this message. We'll see. <laughs> but one of the things is I did not get paid last Sunday at all. And because God convicted my heart this summer about my financial situation, praise God, I have had the opportunity to build into my life a cushion, an emergency fund. My grandmother did this. My grandfather did this. My parents not so much, and me absolutely not. And so what I have done is I have we have shifted our financial thing. We we're going with you guys, okay? I, I'm trying to be. I'm trying. To, I'm trying not to tell you to go somewhere where I'm not. I'm not trying to go up here and go, hey, you need to you need to sacrifice and you need to save and you need to do these things and me not be doing that. I don't want to do that at all. But what I want for you is I want you to be put in a position to where if something like that happens to you, even though it's hard, you and the wife are still smoochy smoochy, <laughs> loving on each other, holding hands, saying, we're going to do this together, baby. And not yeah. <laughs> because there's no money. You've been there. I've seen it. Did you know one of the leading causes of marital breakdown is finances? And you know, I believe that our nation, I believe that our country is in the financial shape that it's in because of a blessing of Almighty God to reveal to us that the ship has been headed in the wrong direction. That materialism is not the answer. That the consumer mindset is not the answer. That we spend it when we get it is not the answer. The answer falls in Christ. The answer falls in our relationship with God. In our culture today, financial stress is completely and utterly normal. It is normal that we have monthly payments. It is normal that we're in debt up to our eyeballs. It's normal that we worry, anxiety, fear, especially in a slow economy like today. It's normal that we have tension in our relationships. It's normal that we're fights, and, 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 and it's very, very normal. And, and I want to say this, it's because we have little or no financial margin. We have little or no schedule margin. We have little or no moral margin. Now, what I want to talk to you, let me give you a good illustration. I'll, I'll work this out in your brain and, and just give you real numbers. Let's say you make $3,000 a month. Margin is you spend $2,500 and you've got $500 for emergencies or margin. You can save. You could buy yourself something nice. You could, most importantly, give. See, this is what I believe is the problem in our church. And this is what I, I really honestly, God revealed this to me this week, Thursday morning. <laughs> In, in the dark. <laughs> no air conditioning. God revealed this to me. He said, this church is not giving because they don't want to. This church is not giving because they feel like they can't. Because of March. Well, I'd like to, Pastor, but we're overextended. And so, if you'll just pray that I've made more money, 
<laughs> then this problem will be fixed. But guess what? Most of you guys, even if you were making more money, would still have no margin because guess what? It's not a not money problem. Because look at it this way. Most of you live in this area. If you make three grand a month, you spend three grand a month. Now there's others of you, and this is another message altogether. You make three grand a month and you spend thirty five hundred. Now that's a whole different series of messages that we're not going to go into today. I'm going to stay over here in the three thousand and the three thousand views. Okay, the financial margin is when you create. And let me tell you something, guys. I'm going to be honest with you, straight up as much as I can. just was able to attain my goal of financial margin. Just able. One week, we got the resources there to provide the cushion the day, almost to the day that the foot fell. Instantaneously, God said, okay, pal, let's test it. Not one argument this week about finances in my own. Not one. Not a discussion. Just a, let's pray. We'll work through it. God's going to be blessed. We're trusting the Lord. God's going to provide. And in my family, I have, to, I have to say this, we provided two meals to two other families that weren't struggling financially necessarily, but were having tough times. Maybe they were in the sick, or they were, or they were, you know, well, most of the sick, it was all sick. <laughs> what else was there? <laughs> Surgery or whatever. And God bless our family this week at a level that I want you to experience. And I believe it is all in the word margin. You know, I don't want financial margin. I want there to be money left over at the end of the month. I want there to be money available to someone who you meet that's in need. I want you to be able to say, man, there's a family there that, that they need a meal tonight. And, and we've got it. We're going to make it. And we're going to go. And we're going to take care of it. I want, I want there to be money available where you, where you say, man, there, I want to go to Haiti next summer. I want there to be money left over where you can say, I want that person to go to Haiti, and I want them to go. And I'm sending them. You know what you could also use this financial, I've noticed that some of these folks in the, that, that, that have answered this question of financial margin, that live below what they're making, are able to take some of that financial margin and use it to get, gain some other margin in time. Maybe I need time to do this, or I need time to do that, and I can hire somebody else to take care of this so that I don't have to take care of that anymore. I'm creating margin. You see that how margin can go into other areas of your life. So let's go turn over here to Proverbs 21, uh, 20, and I'm going to show you that this is what the Bible teaches. Because there's been a lot of talk, and, and, and I don't want you just to go away from here going, wow, that was a great talk. I want you to go around, go over here and say, the word of God has spoken in my heart. And the word of God says this in Proverbs 21, 20. It says this, the house in the house of the wise. Now I want you to know something. In the house of the double income family. No, it doesn't say that. In the house of, of the six figure family. No, it doesn't say that. In the house of the wise. See, money issue is not about how much and how much you can get and making more and making more and making more. We found that we believe that in America for so long that now we are struggling and we don't know the answers. We don't know where to go to get away from the struggle. But God's word is timeless. It's always been here and it's always shared the truth. He says, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but the foolish man devours all he has. When I read that, when I saw that, God said, how many years? No. 
knucklehead? Have you been living like a foolish man? Devouring all you have. And I would say, God, you know, we struggle with trying to get this church out. He goes, I gave you enough every single time. When you were making $12,000 a year, you had enough. And when you are making what you're making now, you have enough. Every single one of us has enough coming in to take care of what we need to do if we create a sell ourselves margin. Now, I, I like about Dave Ramsey. Sometimes you may have to sell a bunch of stuff, get rid of some things. Man, I've been eBaying like a dog in the last month. I've been, I've been lighting up the eBay. I've been lighting up the, the Craigslist. I remember when I worked at the scooter shop. Now I buy stuff. You know, I can get it for like uh, just cost. And, and I was buying stuff, buying stuff, getting it at cost. And, and, and I, was, oh, I walked in my little building. And I go, you got to go. You're going. See you later. Bye. Going to find you guys a new home. Going to put that money in savings. I cried and I had a little tear drop down my eye. When I handed that spear gun to that guy, I remember I, 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 I saved my paycheck to the dive shop. I saved him, I saved him, I saved him. My boss said, hey, I need to pay you, man. And I said, hey, how much do I have saved up? He said, you got $300 saved up in paychecks. And I said, how much you want for that rifle? And he said, it's your cost, 300 bucks. And I said, I'll take the rifle. <laughs> shot a few fish. But I shot a few fish with it. But then I put it on, on Craigslist. The guy goes, how much more for your wife? I said, $300. He said, I'll take it. Found a new home. I got my money back. It was savings. <laughs> I'm trying to sell it to my wife. Don't worry. <laughs> Devours all he has. And, you know, the, the foolish person lives paycheck to paycheck. Let me give you two stories. I have friends. You walk into their house, and I'm telling you, man, you drive up in the driveway and the lawn is like, you take out a ruler or something. You can tell professional, professionals come and cut that grass. It looks gorgeous. You go in their house, it's tile, and, and there's, a, there's a beautiful granite countertops and, and all the stuff. You know, the beautiful sink, the stainless steel appliances. But I know them. And I know that their home is always turned upside down. I know they're always worried about the bills. When I look at that house, I, you know, I don't think to myself, man, they're doing well. When I look at that house, you know what I think? Wow, they're struggling. But then I know another family, you walk up to their house, they hardly have any grass because the kids are just running to death. <laughs> the guy mows it whenever he has a chance or whatever, you know, or they, it just looks the way it does. It looks lived in. And you go in, they got one sink, and you know, it's all that's you know, it's for my good. It does the same thing granite does, but it doesn't, I guess, there's something I don't know. But for my good, countertops, and you know, linoleum, you can see it's kind of peeling up on the edges. And, and, I, and, I, and I walk in, and you know, I kind of notice that stuff. And, and I look around, and I go, they have financially put themselves in such a position that they have margin. Did you know, guys, I want to tell you something, that Forbes magazine did a research, and they said that the other people in this world who are financially well off, I'm talking about people who have worked and made money, did you know they live percent way, 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 way below their means? They don't, they don't live up here. They live kind of normal lives. I had a friend of mine who was a, who was a millionaire. I actually had a buddy who, I, he was a millionaire. He drove an old pickup. Probably had a hundred and something thousand miles on it. Old, old pickup. Matter of fact, uh, had a heart attack and died driving his old pickup. Crashed. And he lived like just like he had a nice farm, but it wasn't like. You know, stupid. What I'm trying to talk about today, guys, is 
It's not how to make more money or pray and ask God to help you make more money. I'm trying to help you to understand that I don't think the answer is to, you know, I do, I think if you reduce this down, let's, let's financially look at it like this. I mean, there is a simple and practical way to fix this. Make more money and spend less money. Okay? I mean, come on. It, that's, a, that's basic economics. You want to you have margin? Make more money and spend less money. But here's the deal. As I see people's lives change, and guys, I've spent 10 years with some of you folks, and I've watched lives transpiring, ups and downs and goes, and, but what I've noticed is the, the key issue is not just make more money and spend less. The issue is a spiritual issue. The reason we do not create margin in our lives, it, it has absolutely nothing, and I've experienced this in my own personal life. I make more now financially than I've ever made in my life, and I'm still, I'm still struggling at, at, at the, at, when, I, when God inter intervened in my life in this. He showed me I was still struggling, and he's like, well, I've given you more, and you're still struggling. It's not an issue of making more money. It's an issue of, of being wise with the money. It's a spiritual issue. It is a, 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 an issue that has to be taken care of spiritually, not financially. See, I believe the problem in this church is not a financial problem. I, the reason I believe that our electricity was cut off in this church was not because of a financial issue. I believe that it is a God issue. I believe it is a spiritual issue. Listen to what Timothy, uh, Paul says to Timothy. But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Not mediocre gain. Not somewhat gain. Not just a little gain. Great gain. He's like big W high five in the air, slap it. I mean, I'm talking double high five or whatever. Ten in the air. Maybe even a, a belly bump. Gain. He's saying godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, well, we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it, but if we have food and clothing, we will be what? Content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and the many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is what? The root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, they wander from faith to pierce themselves and, and, and with many griefs. So great gain with contentment, many griefs. Many griefs for materialism. Consumerism. And so what I want to talk about it is great gain comes with, with godliness, and not only godliness, but a godly contentment. When we look at families and we think, man, they are doing well. But guys, listen, when you really get down to it, they're not doing well. They're in a trap and they're struggling. And this struggle is becoming more than they can bear. Never in the time of our history that I, that I grew up in America, now my grandfather, he experienced this. Now my grandmother, not so much. I'll tell you why. When my grandfather went into the Depression, they lived in the city. And it became extremely difficult for them to make it. I mean, extremely difficult. My grandmother, she goes, you know, I didn't know, she's telling me, I didn't even know there was a Depression. <laughs> Tell your grandfather, don't before we married. Because they lived on a farm. They were content with a house over her head and food in her belly. She said, you know, it was just hard for us anyway. We just, we struggled to get a crop in. We struggled to harvest the crop. You know, we just tried to, you know, we always grow our own food, milk our own cows. We did all that stuff, but it just uh, always been tough, tough, tough. I had a guy tell me this this week. I was talking to him, and he said, I was knocking down in 2004 or 5. He goes, I knocked down one time, take home pay. No joke, he said. He said, this is take home. 
$48,000 in one month. And I said, well, what'd you do with it? He goes, I spent it. Spent it all. He goes, in that year, I made a million dollars. Guys, I'm telling you, it is not the amount of money you make. It is your attitude towards God. It, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with numbers. It has everything to do with your heart. When I see many griefs today, and I see tremendous grief, it's not, in this financial pressure is causing this grief, but this financial stress is not coming because they're not making enough money. It's coming because of the attitude toward God. That is coming from an attitude towards God. So what I want to do is I want to hurry up and I want to move forward. And I want to share with you something real quick. So what do we do? How do we create this financial margin? I want you to look at what uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19-21. He says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth which moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where your treasure is there and your heart will be also. Now, Jesus is in that. He is not even going anywhere over here saying, hey, you don't need an emergency fund. He's not going in here saying, you don't need to save money for a rainy day. He's not in here trying to say, you don't need to have some kind of a financial plan in case something does happen. What Jesus is saying here is, listen to what he's saying. When you are looking to that money as your source of your treasure, where you're putting your treasure, then your heart's in the wrong place. Saving money just to keep it for yourself or holding on to funds and stuff just to keep it for yourself, this, there's, a, there's still, a, finance, there's still a, a moral problem here or a, a spiritual issue that, that needs to be dealt with. Not what he's talking about is, is saving for a rainy day. Here's the prayer, prayer translation of that passage, and I really believe it is. It says, where your money goes, your heart follows. You can not write that down. Where your money goes, your heart follows. You ever see those bumper stickers says, my money's in Florida State? Well, it's not because you're, you, you're just a big time fat and old fan, or somebody might be, but it's just because your kid's there. You know? And your heart with your kid's there. Or, I'll be fair, they say the University of Florida. There's a game. I 
was just trying to be obedient. And because I'm a preacher of the church, I mean, what would it be like? You got, you got, well, no, I don't really. I just kind of... I'm embarrassing. But this is what I really got convicted me about this week that, that just takes me to another level when I think about it.
financial struggles that they've still been going through. How many of you work for an employer that consistently, you know where it got me this week? I missed a paycheck once. I know a family that misses a paycheck almost every single week. And because of their obedience, because of their obedience, God gets them through every single week. spoke to my heart and said, see, I can do more with their 90 than they can with their 100. Let's move on. Number two, when you play first on your finances, you will become supernaturally content. Supernaturally content. Look what it says. It is better to have a little with fear of the Lord than great wealth and turmoil. Show me a person in America today who has just like all this kind of like stupid money. Athletes, actors, rich billionaire kids that don't, they born into it. Their lives are a shambles. I would rather live with the fear of the Lord than I would in all of that. Better have a little with the fear of the Lord. Better, 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 better. Better to have godliness. Better to have godliness and contentment. Better than to have godliness and contentment and, and, and have that contentment that is a great gain. A big win. Than it is to, to have lots and struggle. Better to have that old girl car. When I, I keep telling you guys this, and I'm living on my heart. I still wish I had that thing. My old 88. Delta 88, that 1982 Delta 88. I missed that car with everything. You know, I've only had one new car in my entire life, and I don't even think about it right here, and I'll never miss it. Because I was so glad to see that thing go down the road. But that old, those, those little Delta 88, that guy said, here, you can have it. Cheers. And I drove away with that thing. Liquor popping out. because one of the exhaust liquors was, was shattered in it. It was backfiring through the car break. Drove it all the way home. Got home, fixed it up. Air conditioner worked. The other got the Tahano station. Man, I missed that car. I wish I could go find it. Bring it home and love on it again. Cherry's over here, no way. It's better to drive that old car than putting up that car paint every single week. It's better to drive that old car and pay cash for it than it is to drive that new one. It's better to cut up them old credit cards and live on cash. Man, I love to go to the, I love to go with our little envelope system. We're going to be doing Dave Ramsey's thing uh, starting in January. Uh, I love to go to the grocery store and open up our little envelope and go, this is how much money we spend on grocery today, guys. But you know what? It's guilt-free because when you spend it, you know that's where you wanted it to go. You're not walking home and going to Walmart going, oh no, I'm not going to cover that debit card. You know what I'm saying? You got that cash. You just take it out of the milk money. Go and buy groceries. No deal. It's taking that money and telling it where to go so that I can follow my heart with it. I have no problems following my heart to Haiti and I have no problems following my heart to this place because I get guys I'm sharing this message with you because with everything that's in me I believe this place is worth fighting for I had a guy tell me this story another story this week and God just gave me people this week just to share a story with me after story I had a guy come here and he goes you know what my wife left me I lost all I had I was down. I didn't know what to do. And I came to this church and God spoke to me week after week after week through the messages. He goes, I would just open up my Bible. And he goes, it was just like it was God was grabbing my heart. And he says, it's literally changed my life. And I, and I jumped up on that. I'm like, this is worth fighting for. This is worth getting. 
give you everything for it. Because guess what? You're going to, you, you put God first here, He's going to bless you. You put God first, He's going to supernaturally, He's going to give you contentment. And the third thing, if you give, you put God first here, right after you will end up with more of what matters. See, this is what's going to end, is what you're taking with you to heaven. Because I'm going to tell you something, I've got a ton of funerals. I've got a list of people's funerals I've done. I've probably done in my ministry over, over 30 funerals. Way over that. And that's kind of when I came here as a pastor. You know, it was mostly just church planning and young folks. And, and I did, I went, I think, five or six years without doing maybe one or two. My first church, I did a funeral every other week. And you know what I've never seen? Anybody come up by that cast and go, oh, wait a minute, I'm taking that with me. <laughs> you know what inevitably I've always seen? It's when some person kind of, you know, goes on to heaven, the family is just like, over everything is left. Kids don't want to worry about that. Can we argue with that drunk on my own? It's going to be gone. It's going to be gone. You'll end up with more than matters. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 8, 19, 18 and 19. With me, listen to this, are riches and honor. You know, God's talking about wisdom, but who, who is wisdom? God. He says, with me are riches and honor. With me are lasting wealth and success. With me, are, you know, my fruit is better than fine gold. My gifts are better than finest silver. God says, not only will you, will you be supernaturally content, but your water will change. What you want to see happen is going to happen that's going to be different than what you used to want. These things, I, things that I give are better than the things of this world. Things that I provide are better than the things of this world. Instead of filling your life with things that really don't matter, you begin filling your life with things that are going to last for eternity. Things that are going to be times better. He made one month. He said, you know what? All of that is gone. The houses are gone. The cars are gone. All of it is gone. One thing remains. One thing. Your love. God's love is the only thing that goes on and on and on and on. When you put Him first, you're going to experience His blessings. You're going to be spiritually content by Him. You're going to it, it, so the income issue is not the issue. It's the lifestyle issue, and the lifestyle issue has to be changed by you. You're going to have to put something first in your life besides what's in there now. I want to ask you, everyone, to bow your head. Everyone, to, to close your eyes. I, I, I'm going to talk to you guys at the it, right before you. I'm telling you, with everything that I believe, everything that I, I mean, God has culminated this into a message today that I want to share with you is that is the the thing for me, the thing. God reminded me this week with everything that's been, he goes, Paul, he goes, I am the power of this church, not the electricity. I am the power of this church. I take charge of all of this. I own all of this. There is a lack of margin in your life. We're going to be talking about this over and over and over for the next three weeks. In order to create that margin in your life, you're going to have to put God first. You're going 
to have to allow you to take charge of your life. Okay, everybody that raised your hand earlier, nobody's looking, no eyes are. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would agree that raise your hand? The financial stress, the financial anxiety, the financial problems that are in my life are not a money problem, but are a spiritual problem. How many of you have the guts to raise your hand? Amen. Amen. I'm with you. I realized that this summer God revealed it in my week where I spent with Him. He revealed it to me that Paul, your problem is not more money. Your problem is more me. He did this in the area of my time. He did this in the area of my morals. And He did this in the area of my money. Maybe God's been calling your heart and He's been saying, 
saying, you know you're not living right. You know your eyes are on things that they shouldn't be on. You know that your lifestyle is not, you have any margin. You have no time to serve me because you filled it up with yourself. You have no money to give to my causes because you filled it up with yourself. You have no room for me in your heart because you're immoral. You're living an immoral lifestyle. And I can't dwell in that. It's time to get straight with God. Listen, you, it, 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 it's not going to change my life. It's going to change your life. If you want to stay with right now, it's between you and Him. You know in your heart. Just say, Jesus, I'm tired of living for myself. I want my life to be about you. I want it to be obvious that it's about you. I want people to, be, to be, me to be contagious around me. I want people to say, that dude's different. Not because of my outward appearance, but because of what God's done in my heart. Not because of the clothes I wear, or the house I live in, or the car I drive, or the little symbol that's on the front of the hood.
So in all of your ways, acknowledge him.